Uh, if you're new to faith, we want to welcome you here, especially to the best Sunday ever. Uh, we are excited about today. Uh, not just the ice cream, that's a way to celebrate, uh, but the life-changing message that we're going to get to hear today. And we're praying that God would change all of us through uh, what is shared today. If you are new to faith, please stop at the Welcome Center. There's a gift there that we'd like to give to you and say thank you for being here. If you're a first-time guest, let us know that. You should have gotten a program like this. There's a connection card. And if you let us know that you're a first-time guest, we'll donate $10 to the Cortland Youth Bureau uh, in your honor for the month of September to help make a difference in our community. At Faith, we believe that life is better connected. And the way to do that is in circles, not rows. And so we have small groups that begin this week. Uh, we call them life groups because we want to do life together. So at the Next Steps table in the back here, there's a list of different uh, nights that are being offered, different topics that are being offered. Some are talking about the messages from Sunday. Some, uh, you saw some videos about Financial Peace University. That begins tomorrow night. Uh, there's also a group called Starting Point, and there's a video about that. So a lot of different groups that you could be a part of. There's one about Smart Step Families as well. So I encourage you to uh, sign up for a life group. You can also go to faithincortland.org and sign up that way as well. Uh, some of you know that uh, Russ Warner, one of the leaders in our church, fell uh, several weeks ago and broke his hip, and he is still doing rehab right now. Um, there's a good possibility that he will be in a wheelchair uh, once he gets home. So they are renovating his home, uh, but they need some help in doing that. So this week they're doing some construction stuff. So if that's uh, an interest that you have or a skill that you have, let us know. Uh, you can contact Gary Lawrence if you know who Gary is, or if you don't, uh, just let me know and I can get you his information. Saturday they're going to be painting, so maybe construction is not your thing, but you can paint. Uh, that will be this Saturday, so uh, make some time for that on Saturday. And also in your program, you see a group of uh, individuals that are praying for for the month of September, our prayer focus of the month, and we are praying for our Cortland County legislators this month. So if you go to this link uh, on here, it will tell you which legislator is yours, and you can be praying for them as well as their contact info. Maybe send them an encouraging note thanking them for their service. Great. Well, those of you that have been attending this last uh, month or so, we've been going through a series called Radical Hospitality, Creating a World Without Strangers. And as we've been seeking to apply it to our lives, I've asked Ben and Talitha Johnston if they would just come and share with us their hearts and how they are applying uh, what we were talking about. Talitha is a middle school teacher down at Whitney Point, and yeah, all right, that's and a, that's a good job. <laughs> and uh, Ben is a project manager over at Pyrotech, and so I'd like to begin with this: What does radical hospitality, uh, creating a world without strangers, mean to you? Thanks, Pastor Matthew. Uh, so, radical hospitality. Uh, means to me that the world is full of division uh, and radical hospitality means that we need to look at it and realize that the things that we have in common are far more than the things that we have uh, different. Alyssa? Um, for me, it's becoming comfortable with being uncomfortable. So putting ourselves in situations where we're talking to people that aren't necessarily in our inner circle, your people, um, to be able to show them who Jesus is through us. And why do you b believe, in the, in the day in which we live, why is that so very important? In, in our world today, um, the word Christianity and what some people believe um, Christianity means and what Christians do isn't what God intended. Um, and so I think it's really, really important, and it starts with me, going out there and showing people truly what Jesus' heart looks like through what I do. Ben? And for me, it's the, the realization that uh, there's so much division and brokenness that people have the ideas uh, that you need to keep one group down in order to raise yourself up. So those thoughts and actions allow us to use racism, sexism, and, and other isms uh, to really oppress other groups. So it's, I think it's important to, to change that now. What barriers have uh, you both personally struggled with uh, that really 
uh, that you struggle with in creating a world without strangers, and how have you been able to overcome that? Well, my struggle is making connections. Uh, I have a condition called resting Ben face. <laughs> and, and so I keep people at bay, and that means I'm going to be fairly protected, uh, but that means I also don't make the connections that are really important to life. And I get help overcoming that with people like my wife who see beyond the barriers, see beyond the walls, and, and go over there and help with that connection. Um, I'm, mine's, as well as with Ben's, mine's, mine's a personal journey. Um, I'm going for my administrative degree, and <laughs> God has deliberately put people in my life, either through one of my courses or um, my professors, to show me that I may have some biases deeply ingrained within me that I didn't realize I had, and so being uncomfortable with truly looking at those and deciding, um, reading a lot of books that make me feel uncomfortable but speak truth into my life, and then having those deliberate conversations to help me change. I, I really appreciate your transparency with that because we're all on a journey. We're all seeking to live and love more like Jesus Christ. And so how are you actually personally practicing creating a world without strangers? So this is a, this is a journey for our family, right? Um, and so... Our t we have two teenage daughters, Jenna and Grace, and um, really practicing as a family, seeing a need and meeting a need, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, then starting conversations with people we maybe not know. Um, you know, one of my daughters came home and told me about a need that one of her friends had, and so we decided to go and try to help that family. We didn't know the family. Um, but just try to help and then possibly start a conversation because it starts with those conversations. So see a need, meet a need. Ben? Could you repeat the question, please? <laughs> How are you personally <laughs> practicing creating a world of strangers? Thank you. <laughs> so for you me... You need to call a friend? I do, actually. <laughs> Ernie Oh, That's right. Thank you. <laughs> I guess we didn't need the microphones. Um, <laughs> so for me, it's uh, just to start off with understanding how broken the system is, and that was a big aha moment. Uh, the second step is to realize that I can do a lot better and look at people that do it better than me on making connections. And, and our daughters really are awesome opportunities for us to learn from, including one of them right there. Hi, Jenna. <laughs> um, they see people as people and not as members of groups and I gotta just be humble enough to say that they do it so well and how can I how can I learn from them great thank you Ben thank you Talitha for sharing with us and our our hope and prayer is that when we look into God's word that we put it into practice, and I am so thankful that Ben and Talitha are on that journey, creating a world without strangers. Well, good morning. We are excited you're here. I hope you're excited to be here. Uh, we truly want this to be one of the best Sundays that you will ever experience. Um, that's partly why you get ice cream today. <laughs> Uh, so uh, as you're enjoying your ice cream, as you're enjoying your time together, we want you to remember that we are here to celebrate God. We are here to worship God. We are here to lift him up. And uh, so let's stand together and worship him as we celebrate the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. Jesus is alive. He 
he's alive and oh happy day happy day you wash my sin away oh happy day happy day i'll never be the same forever i am changed when i stand in that place free at last meeting face to face i am yours jesus you are Joy, perfect peace. Earthly pain finally will cease. Celebrate, Jesus is alive. He's alive. And oh, happy day, happy day. You wash my sin away. Oh, happy day. one of those songs where I don't think you can help but smile when you sing about that happy, happy day. This is another one, and we can smile because we are free. Jesus Christ has set us free, and we are no longer trapped by sins. Let's sing about it. Judges my defense, I'm going free. Right when the gavel fell, I heard the freedom bell ring through the heart of hell. I'm going free, I'm going free. Glory, glory, hallelujah. You threw my shackles in the sea. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Jesus is my. Again, that's just not who I am, Lord. I'm a brand new man. I'm going free. I'm on a narrow road. It's paved with grace and hope. It's gonna lead me home. I'm going free. I'm going free. Glory, glory, hallelujah! You threw my 
death no longer has a hold on us. It no longer binds us. It no longer traps us. Jesus Christ arrested death, conquered death. We don't have to fear it anymore. It doesn't have any power over us. That is why we're free. That is why we're happy. Let's keep singing. Without hope and no place to be Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested my life began Dash was redeemed only beauty my orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet arose to dance. When death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down. new now life begins with you release from my 
chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was ransomed He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested and my life began. Washes over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus rose with my freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. That's when death was arrested and my life began. God, we thank you that we are free, that we are no longer enslaved by sin and death, but you have come to break our chains. God, I pray that our mouths would shout your praise, would tell of your greatness to those who don't know you, so that they may experience your love and your freedom. It's your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning. Enjoy your ice cream? <laughs> All right, great. But let me ask you this morning, is life awesome for you or is it less than awesome? In uh, the Lego movie uh, 2, second part, do you relate more to Emmett or do you relate more to Lucy? By the way, who, who here has actually seen Lego Movie 2 yet? Okay, a couple fans out there. All right. How many of you, probably sometime today, you ask somebody, how are you doing, right? How many of you have ever asked someone, how are you doing, and they, resplain, they responded, well, I can't complain? Anybody heard that? Yeah. Or they say, I can't complain, and even if I did, it's not going to do anything, right? And there's some truth to that. And I want to welcome you here to our best Sunday ever. And whether you've been coming for years, or maybe this is your first time, whether you've been a follower of Jesus for most of your life, or whether you're not sure what your belief, 
and you're just kind of checking things out, I want to welcome each and every one of you. And right up front, I want you to know that we're not perfect. And we don't claim to be perfect. But you're among friends who we're seeking to love God and love others. And we're on a journey learning to live like Jesus and love like Jesus. And we invite you to join us with that. Today, we're launching into a new message series called My Big Fat Mouth. And how many of you here would be honest enough to admit that sometimes your big fat mouth gets you in trouble? Anyone? Mine does. James, the brother of Jesus, said that the tongue is one of the hardest things to control. And God wants you and me to understand that our words are powerful. In fact, God says this, death and life are in the power of the tongue. You see, my, my mouth can be used for good or it can be used for bad as well. And so in the next several weeks, we're going to focus on what does God say about how I use my mouth? But before we dig in, I have one more question for you. How many of you are ready for this New York winter? You ready? All right, some of you are. Yep, that's because hunting season's coming, right? Yep, that's right. Others, I, I heard a little bit of a groan there. Uh, even when you know we're going to be talking about complaining, right? And we around here, when winter hits, it's too cold. And when summer hits, it's too warm. It's too hot. When June hits, it's too rainy. And when July and August hit, it's too dry, right? There's something for us always to complain about. But when I think about complaining and the Bible, the very first place my mind goes is back to the example of God's chosen people, the Israelites. They had been in captivity for, we just finished a series not too long ago on the Tanakh, the Jewish scripture. How many years was Israel in captivity? Does anybody remember? I heard it out there. 400 years. That's right, 400 years. And so they were slaves for 400 years, and they complained, and they complained, and they complained. And then God heard them, and he did miracle after miracle after miracle, and he delivered them. He parted the Red Sea. He drowned Pharaoh's army. He gave them bread from heaven. He gave them water from the rock. He gave them clothes that didn't wear out. Blessing after blessing. And yet, what did they continue to do? Complain? and gripe, and grumble. In fact, they even said, it would have been better had we never left Egypt. How many of us are like that sometimes? Moses says something to them that, and really it's something to us as well, that should stun us into a moment of silence. He says this, your grumbling is not against us, but against whom? The Lord. What if every time that I complain, it's not really about my circumstances? It's not really about other people. What if... In God's eyes, every time I complain, I'm actually complaining against God. So here's what I'd like us to do today. Because this is so very, very important. And it affects all of us. We all struggle with this. I'd like us to personalize. And so you don't have to, don't say anything out loud, but I'd like you to ask yourself, what do I complain about 
the most? What do I complain about the most? And I want you to think about it and be, be real honest. By the way, if you're having a hard time thinking about what you complain about most, just ask your parents or ask your husband or your wife or your best friend. Because guess what? They know what you complain about the most. For me, I just ask my wife, what I complain about the most is probably the New York winters. They're so long, they're so cold. And probably second to that would be my schedule. Well, I have to go here, I have to go there, I have to go wherever. Complain, 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 wah, wah, wah. Poor me. What is it for you? What do you complain about? Maybe some of you complain that you're not married. Well, I just, I just wish I was, I was married. And if I was married, then you do get married. And what do you complain about? Your husband, your wife, your kids? Maybe you complain that money is tight or that your house is small or that your boss drives you crazy or, or the meeting is so boring or the sermon is too long. That's supposed to be funny. Maybe it's something smaller. How many have ever complained that the Wi-Fi was so slow? Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe there's nothing on TV to watch. And I want to just clarify something right now. The problem isn't the weather. The problem isn't the schedule. The problem isn't the traffic. The problem isn't that Netflix doesn't have uh, new content enough that fits your approval. What's the real problem? The real problem is that when you and I begin to complain, we get our eyes off of the goodness of God. And where do we place our eyes? On me, myself, and I. You see, my discontent over my unmet expectations is really what leads to the curse of constant complaining. So this morning, I'd like to take the brief moments that we have together, and I want to look at a a text that is is so very powerful to me, and I I hope that it is to you as well. And it's found in Philippians chapter 2. I believe it's either 1083 or 1084, if you're using the Bibles in the chair in front of you. I'd like you to go ahead and turn there. And the book of Philippians was written by a man named Paul. We call him the Apostle Paul. He was sent by Jesus. But before he was sent by Jesus, he was a religious leader that hated Christians. He was a a Jewish religious leader. In fact, he hated Christians so much, he wanted them killed, and he wanted them in prison. And that's what his life work was about, until Jesus, coming back from the dead, appeared to him. And changed everything for the Apostle Paul. And Jesus sent him to preach the gospel, to share the good news of Jesus to those around him. And the top thing on his bucket list, and it's even more than a bucket list because he felt he was called to do this, is that he wanted to go to the city of Rome and preach Jesus to them. But instead of going to Rome as a preacher, he went to Rome actually as a prisoner. It came about like this. When he was in Jerusalem one day, he was preaching and he was falsely accused and arrested. And he became the brunt of both religious and political plotting and he ended up in Caesarea Maritima for about two years. This is actually where Paul appeared before Festus. You can read this in the book of Acts. And where he appealed to Caesar. And so they put him on a ship and they sent him to Rome. 
and he was confined under house arrest there in Rome for another two years. He was chained to different Roman guards, and he awaited possible execution. He didn't know whether he was going to live or die. And you can read about that in chapter 1. Now, frankly, if I was in his place, and I wanted to go to Rome as a preacher, but I ended up there as a prisoner, I would be so tempted to complain to God. I mean, God, this doesn't make any sense. Why are you allowing this to happen? And by the way, if the, I'm the Apostle Paul, I've been shipwrecked, I've been beaten, I've been snake bitten, I've been left for dead. And God, I've done all this to serve you. And now I'm here, a prisoner? The floor is hard, the food is bad, and all of that is probably going through my mind. How about you? And I have to be perfectly transparent with you this morning. Though I have never experienced anything close to what Paul had, I regret that there has been a time in my life and ministry when though I believed I was following God with all of my heart, that people were complaining and they were saying things about me behind my back. And unfortunately, I have to admit that I began complaining to God. And I began wallowing in self-pity, and it was not pretty. By the way, I am also so thankful for God's grace and God's mercy and God's forgiveness. How about you? Because God can change us from the inside out. And even if we have a trouble with our mouth and with our mind and with complaining, there's hope in Jesus. By the way, what God thinks and what He says is so much more important and what truly matters. Do you agree? Absolutely. But here's Paul. And instead of complaining and instead of whining, instead of blaming God or throwing a pity party, He pens a letter to followers of Jesus in Philippi all about joy and peace. And it's incredible. And this is what he said. Look at verse 14. Philippians 2, verse 14. He says this, Do all things without grumbling or disputing. The NLT translates it, do everything without complaining or arguing. How much? All things. Wow. That's a pretty high standard, isn't it? Whatever you do, wherever you are, whatever deed or word Do everything without complaining or arguing about your circumstances or about other people. That's hard. There are a lot of very spiritual reasons why God wants you and me to live without complaining in our lives. There's also a lot of practical reasons. And this morning, my focus is really on the spiritual reasons of why God wants you and me not to complain. But before I do, let me just give you one practical reason. Dr. Travis Bradbury wrote a great book called Emotional Intelligence 2.0. Anybody read that? Great book. I encourage you to read it. And he's done a lot of research on complaining. And, and basically, what he says is that Repeated complaining hardwires your brain. It actually trains your brain to do, guess what? I can't hear you. Complain. See, the more you complain, the more you will complain. 
the more negative you are, the more likely your brain is going to be triggered to continue to be negative. And you will end up what they call is a confirmation bias. Basically what that means is if you accept, if you expect something bad to happen, guess what's going to happen? Something bad. That's what you'll get. Let me give you an example. If someone comes in here today and, and they've decided that they don't like churches, that churches are, are bad, they're just full of hypocrites, and churches, uh, all they want is your money, whatever. And they've decided that they're not going to like something, so the moment they walk in the door, what are they looking for? Bad things. And their preconceived ideas are confirmed because of their expectations. It's, it's kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy. And that happens in all sorts of different areas in our life. If we think it's going to be bad, guess what? That's what we're going to see. Kind of like the Israelites. When they were in captivity, they were negative and complained and complained and complained. And so when they came out of captivity, even though they were free, what did they do? Their mind had been trained to be negative. And they complained, and they complained, and they complained. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to go through life always looking for what's bad. Because there's already enough bad in this world, wouldn't you say? And I want to train my mind to find what is good, what is pleasant, what is positive, what is helpful, what is hopeful, instead of always focusing on the negative. By the way, read Philippians chapter 4. Let your mind dwell on these things. Paul talks about that. And this isn't always easy, especially if you're a natural skeptic like I am. Any natural skeptics out there? All right, maybe a couple of you might admit it. it it's, it's hard, or it's hard if you've been hurt, and it's hard maybe if you grew up in a negative environment, and I get that. Paul gives us a spiritual reason why God doesn't want us to complain. Look at verse 15. It says this, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Would you agree with me that we live in a pretty dark world? I think we do. This last week, uh, we were part of the commemoration service, the 9-11 commemoration service, and we remembered and we'll never forget the evil that took place when those terrorists flew those, uh, attacked our country by flying those planes. We also won't forget the bravery of those who faced it. And in this dark world, you and I, as followers of Jesus, are to shine as lights. I've heard someone say, when, when it's the darkest, light shines the brightest. How do we do that? We do that by showing others what a child of God looks like. What is a child of God to look like? Well, he says right here, we're to be blameless. That means we're to be free from accusation. We're to be innocent. That means we're to be sincere and have pure character. It says we're to be unblemished children of God. See, children demonstrate the characteristics of their father. And, and you and I, as children of God, are to demonstrate the characteristics of our heavenly father. And the way we shine is by being different than those around us and how we use our mouths and how we treat one another. Rather than complaining and arguing about how people didn't meet 
my expectations? What does God want me to do? We don't have time to read it this morning, but I encourage you, go back, read all of Philippians 2. This is within a context. And he says how we're to use our mouths. He says that God wants me to encourage others, not put them down. He wants me to build them up. He wants me to show love and compassion. He, he wants me to work together, united with others. He wants me to put their interests above my own. And ultimately, He wants me to have the attitude and the example, the humble example of Jesus Christ Himself. So that just as Jesus was a light in this world, God wants you and He wants me to shine as a light in this world. And by the way, negativity and complaining never brought someone closer to Jesus. It just doesn't work. If you're a person that's always negative and you're always complaining about this or that, is that going to bring someone closer to Jesus? Are they going to want what you have? Of course not. On the other hand, does that mean that I just go through life and I don't do anything to change my circumstances? That I treat everything as if it's okay? No. No. In fact, I would say this. If you can change your circumstances, change them. Notice here in this verse it says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Don't complain, be the change. It says do. That means there is something for us to do. But without grumbling or complaining or arguing. Back up a little bit. Verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work his, for His good pleasure. Now don't misunderstand what this is saying. You don't work to gain your salvation. It's not what you do, it's what Jesus has already done. Your salvation comes when you acknowledge, I'm not good enough. And when you believe that Jesus died, was buried, and came back to life, and when you call out on Him and ask Him to save you and forgive you and lead you, and when that happens, you cross from death to life, and you become God's child and the, a follower of Jesus. You don't work to gain your salvation, but once you are God's child and His followers, you work out your salvation. You live it out. You let God change you from the inside out. And so if you can change your circumstances, then do something about it. If there are negative circumstances, something that's not right, something that you wish you could change and you can do something about it, do something about it. I'm not talking this morning about just going through life and just saying everything's okay when it's not okay. By the way, it's not wrong or sinful to notice that something is, isn't right. Are we to notice the injustices in this world? Absolutely. But when you and I complain and argue and do nothing about it, God says that's wrong. That's sinful. Let me give you an example. I think one example is Paul himself. If you read in Acts 22 and Acts 23, when uh, he had been arrested and the, the centurion was going to have him beat, he said, well, wait a minute, I'm a Roman citizen. He spoke up. He said, this isn't right. You can't do this. 
Was that okay for him to do that? Yeah. Another example. If you look back in the Jewish scriptures and you see uh, Israel when they're returning from exile and Nehemiah learned that the walls had fallen down, he didn't just sit there and complain and complain and complain. He prayed. And then he did something about it. And he allowed God use, to use him to change it. Don't complain. Be the change. If you see something that isn't right, that's wrong, something that's negative, and you can change it, change it. But many times in our lives, there are things that affect us that we can't change. And if you can't change your circumstances, and if you can't change the other person, then change your perspective. Change your perspective. Well, how do you do that? Look at verse 16. It says here, holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. If you can't change your, your circumstances, change your perspective. In other words, align your perspective with God's perspective. How do you do that? By holding fast to God's word. By hanging on to it. By being in God's Word. When you go to God and His Word, it will change how you view challenging people, how you view difficult circumstances. And when you trust God and His Word and you would allow it to renew your mind, it will change what you see, it will change what you think, it will change what you say, it will change how you respond. I think Paul is a perfect example of that. And this is so powerful. Again, I want to remind you, he is chained to Roman soldiers 24 hours a day. He's awaiting possible execution. His dream was to preach the good news of Jesus in Rome, but instead he's a prisoner. And this is what he says, even if I'm poured out as a drink offering Upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. By the way, what's the opposite of complaining and arguing? Being glad and what? Rejoicing. Rejoicing. You might hear what I just read and think, what in the world does that mean to be poured out as a drink offering? Well, this, this refers back to when the priests would make a sacrifice to God. And so what they do, they, they take a lamb or maybe they would take a bird and they would put that on the altar and they'd put fire to it and they'd offer it a burnt offering. And then they would take a person's what was called a drink offering and uh, they would they would take uh, some very expensive liquid. Usually it was like wine. Sometimes it was honey because that was sometimes hard to come by. And they would pour it out over top of that burnt offering. And, and so as it burned, a sweet aroma, uh, an incense offering would rise up to God. And that's a word picture that Paul is giving is that his life is being poured out as a sacrifice on top of their sacrificial faith. And this is what he says, even if I'm being poured out, even if my life is being sacrificed, I'm glad and rejoice. And not only that, I invite you to be glad and rejoice with me. Rather than complain, he says, be glad and rejoice. Which, by the way, this isn't the first time that Paul rejoiced when he was a prisoner. Go back to Acts chapter 16, actually in the city of Philippi, where he and Silas sang while they were in prison. How could Paul be glad and rejoice in prison? He could do it because Paul was not the center of his story. 
Jesus was the center of his story. And because Jesus was the center of his story, Paul could change his perspective about how he saw things, about the negative situation which he was in. Let me give you an example. If you were to turn the page and go back to Philippians chapter 1, it gives you an insight into how Paul changed his perspective. In fact, in chapter 1, verse 12, he says this, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. It's for the best. He's not complaining. He's changing his perspective. He's seeing the power and the goodness of God even in the miserable circumstances that he's in. And what he sees is that as a prisoner, the message of Jesus is still going forward. In fact, he says this, verse 13, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. Here's what he's saying. My circumstances have resulted that all these soldiers are hearing about Jesus. Kind of like this. You think I'm a prisoner? Guess what? Let me tell you who the real prisoner is because every eight hours I get someone new chained to me. Some of the most powerful people in all of Rome chained up to my arm for eight hours. Can you say, captive audience? That Paul has, has a message prepared for each one of them to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. You think I'm a prisoner here? Guess what? Look at how God is using these circumstances. You've got no idea how God may be using your circumstances. You may see it as negative, but God wants to use it for the kingdom of God. Now, there's a lot of reasons why you and I might com complain But rather than complain, if I can't change my circumstances, I can change my perspective. Because I know and believe that God works all things together for good for his purpose to those who are loved and called by him. You see, even in the midst of circumstances, I see the goodness and the power of God. Maybe you're here today and you, you're in a place that you don't like. Does God have a plan for your life? Does he have a purpose for you? It may not be what you would have chosen. It may not be what you would have ever wanted. But God can still use it to spread his message of hope and to share the message of Jesus Christ and impact the lives of others so that you can shine as a light. Think about it. Paul was chained for 24 hours to Roman soldiers. And so I want to ask you this morning, what are you chained to? Now, don't say my husband or wife, okay? But maybe you are chained to a very painful relationship right now. How does God want to use that? Maybe you're, you're in a jo job situation and you don't know what you're going to do. Or, or maybe you feel chained to a financial problem. You're, you're in this big hole and you don't know how you're going to get out of it. Or maybe for you it's a health problem. The list could go on and on. And so let me say, if you can do something about it, do it. If you can pray, pray. And all of us can pray. If you can work hard, work hard. If you, if you can get counseling, get counseling. 
If you can seek help, seek help. If you can get wisdom, get wisdom. If you need to turn over a leaf, turn it over. Do something about it. But even if you can't do something about it to change your circumstances, then at least change your perspective. Change the way you look at it. Get into God's Word. See it through God's eyes. Change the way you think about it. Change the words that you speak about it. And rather than complaining, choose to see God's presence and power in the midst of it. Even if it's something you haven't asked. And I love the words that Paul uses here. He says, even if. Those are so powerful. Even if, I'm going to be glad and I'm going to rejoice. For you, it might be even if I continue to suffer in my body, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to still praise God each and every day. Even if I wake up with these migraines day after day after day that never go away, I'm still going to declare His goodness even if I cry myself to sleep at night praying for a miracle, I'm going to fall asleep praying to God and praising Him. And even if I continue to look for a job and they let me go and things don't work out the way I wanted them to, I'm going to still trust the goodness of God. You might be sitting there and and you might be thinking, well, I'm not sure that I can do that. And guess what? Without Jesus Christ in your life, you probably can't. Later, Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In whatever circumstance I'm in, I've learned to be content. It's only through Jesus. And so it begins with a personal relationship with Jesus of becoming his child, calling out on him, asking him to save you and forgive you and lead you. And then as a follower of Jesus, of getting in his word and getting his perspective each and every day. It begins by making Jesus the very center of your story because without him, it is probably impossible. One last thing. Everybody take out your lip balms that you received on the way in. Get it out. This week we have a very practical application for this. Okay? Hold it up. Everybody hold it up. All right. If you didn't get some, uh, are, there, are there any left in the back there? Okay. So grab one on the way out if you didn't get one. But this is what I want you to do. All right? This week, God, God talks in his word about setting a guard about our mouth. Right? So we're going to remind ourselves to do that in a very practical way. So every time you're tempted to complain or every time you complain this week, I want you to pull this out, take it with you, and I want you to put it on. All right, can we do that? And remember that God doesn't want us to complain. He wants us to rejoice. Now, some of us are going to have some pretty moisturized lips this week, aren't we? That's right. So it's a very practical way that you can remind yourself to do what God wants you to do. Don't complain. Be the change. And next week, we're going to add something else to that. Father, as we come before you now, we thank you for your word. And we thank you that your Holy Spirit is at work in us. And God, I pray that we would be careful how we use our mouths this week. This is something that we all struggle with. Lord, help us not to complain, but help us to rejoice and to, to think about our circumstances and about people the way you do. God, help us to apply this to our lives this week. In Jesus' name.